Welcome to Tau Capes. I'm Cody Nestor. First off, apologies for the delay in releasing new content. It's been one thing after another recently. Todd and his family have been dealing with some illnesses. Todd was sick, then some members of his family were sick. Thankfully, it looks like everyone is feeling better. Everyone's back at home, and Todd should be back recording with us here in a few days, hopefully this weekend uh, at the latest. Uh, I was hoping to have this video out even sooner, but uh, the last hurricane had other plans. Uh, she took out the power for a few days as well, so this video is delayed in coming to you. But at this point, everyone is okay. The power is back, and so is Tau Capes. Uh, and today we have a new member of the Tau Capes family joining us. Joining us today is Christina. Christina, how are you? I am good, thank you. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. It's just Christina, by the way, right? Like Cher? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, just one name. Uh, if you stick around uh, long enough to the end of the video, we're going to throw a few questions at Christina, get to know her a little bit better and her uh, what she nerds out about. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about Agatha All Along. Christina, we're talking about the first three episodes today of Agatha All Along. Starting with episode one, what did you think the story was? Okay, so episode one, we're re-entering the world of Westview by way of a true crime obsession with a dead lady in the woods. So Agnes is a cop with an indiscernible accent and maybe a dead child. Um, April Ludgate from Parks and Rec is here as a <laughs> FBI agent and possibly a jilted ex. Uh, we have some pizza party girl time. Agnes assaults a teen who breaks into her home. And after much ado, we eventually have Agatha Harkness revealed. She has been trapped under Wanda's spell for three years and is finally awakened, completely butt-ass naked, ready to reclaim her glory. Uh, that leads us to a little sexually charged knife fighting with our jilted ex before we are warned of danger to come. Yeah, I love a good sexually charged knife fight. Uh, <laughs> me, and, me and Todd have them all the time. Uh, obviously, Agatha all along, it kind of spins out of the events of WandaVision. Uh, it's kind of crazy that it came out over three years ago. It, it's kind of crazy that it's been that long. I, for one, remember some things. There's like a there's a white vision running around. Wanda had all these people trapped in a town. She had fake kids. It was an I Love Lucy parody, then a Leave it to Beaver parody. So I guess to start, two-part question here for you. What did you think of WandaVision in general, kind of going back to that show? And do you think people who haven't seen WandaVision will understand what the fuck is going on in Agatha all along? <laughs> so first, I absolutely loved WandaVision. I genuinely think it's one of the best Marvel series offerings we've had. Um, if you've not seen WandaVision, you might think you've started the wrong show when you start the first episode. That first episode might not make much sense to you at points, um, nor is it going to have those scant moments, and I do mean scant, uh, that hook in us returning viewers. So you know, the little thing, CW, Maximoff, scroll across the library card, things like that. Um, beyond most of that first episode, I think at this point in the series, you can probably just accept that it's a show about witches and roll with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't even, you don't even get a previously on or anything. You're just dropped into this, <laughs> this parody, like you mentioned before. It kind of drops you into like a gritty noir kind of cop TV show parody uh, called Agnes of Westview. I appreciated the kind of true detective style opening credits that they went for for this fictional show. But that's about all I really enjoyed of the premise early on. Uh, Agatha here, she stars as Agnes O'Connor. She's investigating the death of a young woman, like you mentioned, found dead in the forest, apparently from being crushed by something. Surprise, surprise, it ends up being uh, Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch, Elizabeth Olsen, or at least here a body double stand-in for her. Elizabeth Olsen, at this point at least, is not involved at all in this episode, and it kind of brings back those a little bit of rough memories I have from how this character was treated coming off of WandaVision, which I also really enjoyed too. I really enjoyed WandaVision. I thought it was one of the probably maybe actually my favorite Disney Plus Marvel series. And then just to see how she was treated and that character was dispatched by being crushed under a fucking rock at the end of Multiverse of Madness. It kind of brings <laughs> up all those sore memories I have from that. Um 
I was I was doing a little bit of research when uh, kind of going around when the show started. We're three episodes in at this point. Um, apparently, Disney's uh, got some plans to potentially resurrect Wanda here, bring back Elizabeth Olsen, give her own so- solo film. So I wouldn't be surprised if she was our big cameo or shows up by the end of this. Uh, again, just rumors at this point, but. For me, I think the opening of Agatha really kind of, it does just throw you in. I'm glad we kind of got through and kind of concluded the fictional cop show premise by the end of the episode because it wasn't wasn't really doing much for me. What did you think about the the just dropping into this fictional true detective style uh, cop show? And like, did it, was it off-putting? Did you go with it having seen WandaVision? Yeah, I, you know, I'll be real. I had to watch this episode twice to be able to give the series a chance. Um, and as somebody who's a fan, I think that kind of says a lot by itself. The first episode did feel convoluted for no reason. Um, there's this kind of hacky overacting going on in this fictional cop show, and that kind of took me out of it. By the time it did start getting interesting, I was a little bored. Um, So I will say it was better on the second watch, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, that's, a, that's a line that you could put on this show. Is, it might be better, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's, say, that's saying something because it's like it's almost a barrier to entry. Here you are, a, a, a fan, because you, you kind of brought this up to me because I was making the schedule for, you know, what we're going to watch and review and stuff. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, you guys are going to check out Agatha all along. And I'm like, oh, that's even coming out. I was like, I forgot all about it. And, um, you know, it wasn't – it's a character, again, that – uh, you could argue, does this show deserve to, you know, even exist? Is anyone really interested? I think there definitely are fans like yourself, and it's kind of surprising too that you started off in such a way, um, one that you don't really set up. You get no previous setup from the only other show she's appeared in in the universe, and you just kind of drop right into it. And the barrier entry is so kind of difficult at first that even a fan of Wandavision like yourself had to go back and give it a second chance to even kind of enjoy it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it really was surprising because like you mentioned, I've been kind of hyped about this for a while. I was really going in with, you know, pretty good expectations, not sky high, but I'm excited about this. And that first episode was just kind of a bummer. Um, You know, as we go along, we'll talk more. But first episode, y'all, you might have to give it a couple tries, honestly. Yeah, I think, yeah, I really think um, you know, something I was going to talk about later, but I'll bring it up here. I really think episode one and two should have been kind of blended into one bigger episode. And I yeah. think that would have helped a lot. But anyway, before we kind of talk about our thoughts overall, and the, the how the first episode shakes out, you kind of mentioned Aubrey Plaza before. She's around. She's a fictional FBI agent. She's got uh, some sexual tension going on with Agnes here in our fictional cop drama. I like Aubrey Plaza. I really, really like her in most things. Again, I'm a big Parks and Rec fan too, so April Ludgate forever. But I there isn't much for her here at all uh once you kind of get agatha kind of snapped out of her spell by this kind of mysterious teenage uh, boy uh you kind of get her reveal as a character called that i had to actually go back and research what her actual name was uh rio vidal uh there's a lot more rumors about her character apparently she could be playing a reimagined version of death seemingly now more of a supernatural entity than a cosmic one like she is in the comic books again that's just the latest rumor she could just be some character called Rio Vidal she could spin off into anything and be anything else she could also be working for Mephisto did you catch we actually get our first name drop of Mephisto in a MCU yes. project Christina yes super Every- exciting Yes, nerds have been foaming at the mouth for years about everything is Mephisto. Everything that you don't have an answer for immediately, it's Mephisto. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, anyway, April Ludgate, she's around. She wants to kill Agatha, and Agatha's all like, hey, I'm all weak and stuff. Uh, You wouldn't want to kill me. I'm all powerless. Let me get my powers back, and uh, then let's fight. (laughs) And, uh, you know, April Ludgate goes for it. Aubrey Plaza goes for it. It's a very it's a very Dragon Ball villain kind of move to pull. It's like, hey, I'm not up to power, Goku. Let me let me power up for a few episodes. Let me get to my peak, and then we'll <laughs> we'll come back and fight at the end of the show. So Aubrey Plaza, she agrees. She fucks off. Uh, she tells her some. Uh, she tells Agatha there's some there's some bad witches coming for her at sundown. And oh yeah, we also have the mystery boy who she thought she arrested while she was under kind of this spell, keeping her in the fictional cop show. She finds him locked in the closet. 
roll credits. And that's basically how episode one kind of closes out. That's really everything that kind of mostly happens in the episode. And I honestly got, I watched this and the end credits end with some like, you know, nice visual end credits. And it also ends with, uh, this, I forget the name of the song, but it's like, uh, must be the season of the witch. Everybody will know it. Um, and I was like, I was sitting there thinking, I'm like, man, this is my favorite part of the show is the end credits. <laughs> <laughs> I was like the song and the vibe that the end credits gave off. And there's like, uh, it's like witches through popular culture. Like there's a, I think Lisa Simpson as a witch and things like that. Like in just the song choice, I'm like, oh, this is my, this is my favorite part of this episode so far. So Christina, what worked for you and what didn't work for you in episode one? <laughs> yeah, Season of the Witch by Donovan. Great song. Donovan. Um, yes. Um, you know, like I mentioned, the crime drama thing, it just didn't work for me at all. Like the weird accent, that purposefully hacky acting, it just took me out of it every time. I 100% for a moment thought I might have started the wrong show on my own, right? So mm -hmm. I just, I was legitimately bored for most of it. I, I do suppose that acrobatic knife fight was kind of fun, uh, but the episode in general, just it didn't do it for me. I did really enjoy that moment we have near the end, cycling through the different versions of Agnes before we get to that final reveal, the black and white WandaVision reveal, glorious. That was really the only part that I genuinely enjoyed in the first episode. And like you said, the end credits are fantastic. You know, the craft, Lisa Simpson, it was great. Yeah, um, I agree with you. I think that's that's my initial gut reaction from episode one is it's just boring. It's not interesting. I didn't find my, I think you asked me after we watched it, um, kind of one sentence review. And I was like, part of it is like not very compelling. There's not, there wasn't any meat on the bone here that I was like, oh, okay, I'm ready to go in episode two. I could have frankly just left it there and just been like, this is not for me. Because there was nothing interesting at all that that set up for future episodes that, that wanted me to like kind of come back for this. I'm like, oh, I can't wait for episode two. It was just like, this is pretty, this is pretty mediocre. This is pretty boring. This is pretty average kind of stuff. So like, I'm right there with you. There's a couple moments here and there that the the acting does get a little hacky and it, did, it does get a little over top. And, and a lot of it is intentionally, but sometimes, uh, sometimes maybe not even. So it, it's really kind of all over the place. And I think, like I said, we really should have blended episode one and two together and made something uh, a little bit more palatable and easier to kind of get into for fans that maybe didn't watch WandaVision. Uh, we'll go episode by episode here, but give me your uh, review score for uh, episode one here of Agatha all along. Okay. I'm going to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Initial watch, it was definitely a five. I think it was mediocre. After the second watch I did, I'm going to go with a very precarious six. Decent, and I do mean precarious. Um, you know, as we go along, I kind of feel parts of it, at least, are a necessary episode, I suppose. But it almost felt like preemptive series filler at times. I agree. I think it could have been blended first and second into a better, more concise episode that was a little more compelling. I wish we could have gotten into the story quicker, but it did have that moment I truly enjoyed. So precarious six, just barely decent for me. Yeah, I'm I'm in the ballpark. I'm gonna be a little less nice. I think it's a it's a five <laughs> for me. It's mediocre. That was my initial mediocre has kind of come our version of mid. It falls right in the scale uh, from right in the middle of our review scale. So for me, it's mediocre. There, like I said, there wasn't a lot compelling me to watch episode two or, or further. Um, I think for a, 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 a not a pilot but a, a first episode of this new series I think you could have done more to bring in the older fans that would watch WandaVision three years ago catch them up to speed on what was important what should they should remember from WandaVision give us a little previously on and that would also be helpful for new people that may haven't had a chance to go back and watch WandaVision or maybe wasn't interested in that, but see this as something maybe they're more interested in. So for me, it's right in the middle. It's very mid. It's very mediocre. And overall, episode one is pretty boring. So going on to episode two, what's going on in episode two, Christina? 
Okay, episode two. So, that teenager that Agatha kidnapped while still under Wanda's spell in episode one, he's still hanging around in her closet. So <laughs> we learn that he is a total Agatha fangirl who freed her from Wanda's spell. He wants to walk the witch's road, as whomever is able to survive walking the road is granted what they desire the most. Yeah, he wants power. Of course, he wants power, and Agatha desperately needs her powers back, right, if she's going to survive, so it doesn't take much convincing. After Agatha thinks an old card table is a car for some reason, um, off we go to round up a coven. <laughs> I didn't understand that. I didn't understand I that at all. I don't understand what the point of that was. Maybe it was her still coming out of the spell, but I, I didn't get it. Um, again, enough. another moment that took me out of it. Um, so we're off to go round up a coven. Um, the team, um, despite our team glitching out a few times, we do uh, kind of collect a ragtag bunch of gal pals who all have their own reasons to walk the road. And one very annoyingly long song later, we finally start the dirty barefoot road down the witch's <laughs> road. Yeah, it turns basically turns episode two ends with uh, the Wizard of Oz is basically <laughs> what it turns into. Um, yeah, you mentioned the boy in the closet here. He's referred to as Teen. Now the character himself was found in the closet. The uh, the uh, the actor and his portrayal in the uh, in the show the the uh, the boy is definitely not in the closet in the show. If you know what I mean. <laughs> he's definitely very much out of the closet in the show, which is something we'll talk about here in a minute with the show overall. But yeah, he wants to walk the witch's road. He needs Agatha's help. He's referred to just as teen, and he has this kind of auto-mute name feature in the form of like a glamour spell someone's placed on him. Anytime he tries to reveal his backstory or his name or anything about himself, he has an auto-mute feature. So that's that's something that comes up and shown a little bit more in detail a little bit in episode three, but we do get it here in episode two. Um, just some kind of behind the scenes researchy stuff, rumor stuff. Uh, people have kind of been theorizing um, that he's actually playing Wiccan, which is Billy Kaplan, the reincarnation of Billy Maximoff, Wanda's son, kind of taking that from the comics. But that's a big we'll see with this show. It's possible, but you never know anymore what direction Marvel's kind of going with some of this stuff. But that's the big rumor at the time. And like you said, most of the episode is devoted to uh, you know, recruiting witches. It's time to recruit some witches. We get four of them here. Well, three technically, because one of them isn't a witch as such. Um, our first witch is, uh, is it Lilia? Is that Lilia. her name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lil Lilia Calderon. She is, she's kind of her expert in divination. They kind of find her at this kind of like uh, kind of tarot, medium, read your future kind of thing. Her and Agnes have a little backstory. Obviously, they have a little history together um, with her and uh, Agnes Agatha, I should say. Uh, Alice Wu Gulliver, she is another uh, witch that is recruited. Uh, this is the one, if I'm not mistaken, with her. It's She's trying to find out what's happened to her mother who walked the road at one point. Is that right? Exactly, yeah. Her mother died, and she wants to find out what happened. And she's our she's shown to be our protection witch. So you need a certain combination in your coven. Divination is one. Uh, Alice Wu, she fills out the protection angle. Then we get Jennifer Kale, and Jennifer is our potions <laughs> witch. We kind of see her running her own shop. It gave me, like, Gwyneth Paltrow goop vibes. Mm -hmm. With the last name Kale, yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and like, you know, uh, Agatha's going in, talking about jade eggs and Kegels and those kind of things. Now, that whole scene was like very cringe to me, honestly. None of the none of the humor in episode two. I asked you after, I think, episode two, if you thought this show was funny. And we both kind of agreed it's one of those like, <laughs> might give you a little... <laughs> Yeah, like maybe. it has a chuckle moments. <laughs> maybe, yeah. But I found this, the whole, the, I like the the setup for her character, but like just the, the kind of jokes they were going for, I found it just kind of, the humor just kind of misfired for me mostly throughout this whole episode. But uh, Jennifer, she's our potions witch. And then finally we get our last witch who is not really a witch, uh, Mrs. Hart. She is a um, returning character from WandaVision. Uh, also, her real name Sharon Davis, which no one, everyone refuses to call her. She's just Mrs. Hart. Sharon Davis, she was a resident of Westview. She became Mrs. Hart when she was kind of under the influence of uh, Wanda's hex. But she's our last, uh, she's kind of our Earth Witch because she has a green thumb, and I guess Agatha just went and grabbed her, basically. 
She can grow flowers, and she's like, eh, Earth Witch, fine. <laughs> and like you said, the last part of the episode, we finally get whoever is coming for Agatha um, from Rio's warning that Agatha had some witches coming for her at sundown. They finally slow walk through town just long enough for all the witches to get together and sing the uh, Walk the Rich, uh, Witches Road song, which goes on. I was mm-hmm. with you. We kind of talked about it. I was fine with it for the first like 30, 45 seconds. And I'm like, okay, that's where it ends after this, that, this verse. And it just keeps going. Yeah. It won't, it just doesn't <laughs> stop. There's so many more verses to it. And these, uh, these bad witches that are looking for Agatha, they're just, they're giving her all the time in the world. They're just slow walking down the middle of the, the road, middle of the town, just ominously. So thank you, uh, bad witches for waiting for, we finish our song. We much appreciate it. <laughs> uh, do you kind of care to explain what all the singing is all about? Yeah, so essentially our, our sassy little coven, we're performing a ritual to open the road here, but in a cappella song form. Um, mm. So lovely voices, a little ringing of a bell, comedic relief from Mrs. Hart because she doesn't mm. know the song. Um, that opens the door, the journey begins, and look, you know me, Cody. Christina <laughs> is a true fan of a musical moment. But this shit just dragged the fuck on. I <laughs> honestly think that they were just showing off that they got Patty Lapone cast here. And they were right. like, let's get our money's worth. Because it, the shit just ran on. And the Salem 7 apparently move really slowly. So Yeah, yeah. They, they like to keep time with the music on screen. They, <laughs> they like to build the dramatic tension and stakes before they act. So, yeah, uh, it does finally open up the Witch's Road. Someone's like, hey, what's that? Was that there before? There's a big door in the floor. At one point, they all take it, head down to the Witch's Road, and narrowly kind of escape um, the other bad witches that are coming for them. Um, lots of time spent recruiting, lots of time spent setting up the Witch's, which I think – is a good thing. I think the problem is some of the ways it was set up is that you get a little bit more of that over the top acting from Catherine Hahn. Most of the comedy is a misfire here. And I feel like, again, this should have just been wrapped into episode one and done like a combo episode. Cause it's like a nine episode series, I think. So like that could yeah. have easily been eight and you could have taken elements from episode one, blended them into two. And I think made a better episode that would have been, you could have gotten what happened to Agatha at the end of the WandaVision. That could have been the first part of epi- the, the combined episode. And you could have took it right into what you get here, which is the recruitment, which is what episode two is. It's the, it's the, episode that actually drives the story forward to what the series I guess is going to be for the next few episodes and the majority of the episodes like you could have blended that together and I think had a much easier time and a much more compelling first episode instead of breaking these two up and what you get here because the thing with all these Disney shows too these these fucking episodes are still coming in about 30 minutes they're yeah. not like full 42 to 55 minutes like like some of the other shows that you'll get from other, you know, drama networks, HBO shows and like that. They're about 30 minutes, 32, 35 minutes, somewhere like that. So you could have easily kind of blended them into a, a, a actual 45 minutes to an hour episode and just made that episode one and then start episode two with our what we got in episode three. But um, what's your thoughts? What's your take on episode two? And then give me your review score. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with what you said. I think that episode two, I actually enjoyed it. Um, I think that episode one, it was just banal. It was boring. It it just seemed like way too much excessive setup filler that we didn't need. Episode two really did seem to propel the storyline in a more meaningful and compelling way. We got some interesting backstories for some of our witches. I agree the whole influencer tinged references thing, not for me. That's fine though. Um, I like the pull of the influencer feel for the modern potions witch. Um, I do feel like this episode feels more like what I was hoping for with the series. So I am going to be nice again and give it a seven. I think it was good. I like uh, hearing the backstories for our other witches. Gotcha. I'm still, I'm still a little tougher on it. I'm still going to say this was not much better than episode 
one, I think it is it is still in the same score, but just a slightly better. It's higher on the score. Almost almost gets a six for me, but I'm still giving it a five because again, I was pretty bored and the comedy just wasn't there for me. Now comedy is super subjective, like everything else with art, but comedy is super subjective. So I can see some people maybe getting a chuckle out of it and maybe getting more out of the comedy than someone like me, but it just fell flat for me. And uh, again, I kind of hold it against these first two episodes that this this was not a great way to start the show with how these first two episodes kind of played out and the order that they were shown. So I'm still going to say five mediocre because, again, I was still pretty bored by the end of this episode. Maybe that changes a little bit when we get to episode three. So let's go on to episode three here. Uh, let the shenanigans ensue. We're on the witch's road. Vis- visually interesting. For first off, like I found it visually interesting. It is basically the Wizard of Oz. It's a it's a it's a, it's a road of uh, leaves that we're following here, uh, and and that's basically what it is. It's just shenanigans on the road until we get into our first trial on the road. Everyone's kind of trying to figure out things. Mrs. Hart is having her little freak out. She's like, I mean, her I shouldn't be here type moment, straying off the path and things like that. I think we kind of both agree. Uh, just kind of in the little bit of conversation we had after we both watched this, I think, would we both agree that this is the best episode of the first three? Yeah, I, I absolutely. This is definitely the fir- best episode, and it's definitely the most compelling so far. It's what's going to give me hope for the rest <laughs> of the episodes. This is right. the one. Yeah, it was the first episode that I didn't find boring. I was actually compelled, and I, I was actually interested in, in the episode, I wasn't bored throughout. So I kind of give you the setup. We're on the road and stuff, and we're, we're getting to our first trial on the Witch's Road. What's happening there with the first trial in episode three, Christina? Right. So we're on the Witch's Road. Um, we first learn that the teen has actually had a sigil placed on him. That's what's responsible for those cool matrix glitches that we're seeing before. <laughs> um, again, like you mentioned, Mrs. Hart gets herself uh, a little a little sticky situation when she gets off the road. But then they find this really cool house that kind of starts the trials of the road. And the first one is this kind of housewife wine drinking mom energy where mm. it is a wine poison that we are all taking part in here for this first trial yeah it's a very like desperate housewives vibe very and it has different effects um that it hits them kind of in a row going in order from the order that they drink it in so mrs hart was unfortunately our guinea pig here Hmm. and she gets the brunt of the trial um but interesting moments here some weird facial cosmetic effect yeah they, everybody situations. gets a, a bad uh, botox housewife i, I thought that was kind of <laughs> clever everyone gets the big lips and the puffy face kind of looking like uh, a bad botox box job everybody's looking like rocky dennis um it's yeah i mean it's it's funny it's clever it fits the theme that they were going for um again the comedic moments here they didn't make me laugh out loud so much but i didn't find the comedy as kind of insufferable and as much of a miss as I did in the first two episodes. I think with the way the trial kind of shakes out and some of the body stuff, some of the, you know, them having to kind of work together, figure it out, brew a potion. And uh, I love how we're doing all this potion stuff. And it's like, you know, I need this like really weird sounding thing. And it's like, Oh, it's just like an apple or a lemon or whatever. (laughs) Like some of that stuff worked. And like, it was, it was, I'm not saying it's the most compelling thing I've ever seen, but it was way more compelling than the first, two episodes um i think i think you know i feel like as we get into it it's like the show really is going for like a very camp feel i think that's intentional at this point it's really going for that kind of camp vibe especially when katherine hahn is on screen kind of hamming it up but i don't hate it like i did i didn't hate it at least as much as i did or dislike it as much as i did in the first two episodes I think it's starting to find its footing a little bit in how hammy and campy it's going to be. Would you would you think would you agree with that? Is it is it kind of finding its footing more about what it's trying to do here with some of the comedy? Yeah, super agree that this third episode is really where it's settling in. Like I said, the weird hacky overacting in the crime noir feel feels weird. 
because mm-hmm. it's in this really serious setting and then she's just in, in this weird indiscernible accent overacting but by the time that we get to agatha you know she's agatha and it really mm-hmm. does fit with her character i think at that point it starts being more believable and i agree it does really find its footing i think this episode is setting what it's going to be like for the rest of the series yeah, if, if the rest of the episodes are mostly like this, you know, until we get to, you know, our, our penultimate and fin- you know, finale, if we get some more interesting trials with these characters and them working together and, you know, there's some little bit of Agatha stuff trying to, not so much backstab, but she was trying to, like, not drink the wine. She was going to, you know, let everybody else kind of be the guinea pig and not join along. Like, some of her Agatha-type stuff. Like, if we get more of that and, and some more of these trials and interesting stuff happening throughout the show – like until we get to the finale like i think it will manage to keep my interest and kind of turn me around on the show overall because again i think this is the strongest episode i hope more of this is to come now i'm not i'm not saying this is the best thing ever i'm not saying this is the best marvel show but episode three was at least more compelling and now where i am like okay what do you got for me episode four (laughs) um go ahead no, I would say I, I agree. I'm really excited after we saw these trials that were really specifically aimed towards our potions witch, right? Mm. I'm really excited to see what we're going to have coming up for our protection witch, our one that wants to find out about what happened to her mother. Watching episode three and how they use the potion witch's skills really does have me excited for seeing what we're going to do with the rest of our coven. And the big, uh, the big kind of shocker, I guess I would say, from this uh, episode, we do, Mrs. Hart does kind of succumb to the poisoning. They were unable to kind of save her, at least at this point. So Mrs. Hart, at this point in the show, is is presumed to have died. Will that change before the end of the show? I would assume so. I would assume she will probably, if I had to guess, she will probably undertake some type of metamorphosis and really become an Earth Witch. What do you think? Yeah, I, I that is my hope. I, we're not going to, clearly, as we've stated, when we start on the road, our coven tells us that the Earth Witch is arguably the most important witch mm-hmm. that we need when we are on the road. We know that Mrs. Hart, quote unquote, This is what she does uh, in her regular life. So I think that we are going to be seeing her again. Like you mentioned, it's Marvel. You never know. Um, But I definitely don't think that's the last that we're going to see of Mrs. Hart. Yeah, I think if they were to really you know kill her off and she doesn't make any more appearances i think that would be kind of a waste because she everybody she's you know an actress that everybody kind of knows it's like oh she's the mom from that 70 show and everything else <laughs> and i think she's very cute and, and funny and she's a fish out of water and a little bit of our our way to kind of see into the show is she's kind of our point of view character a little bit because she can ask those questions like what the hell is this and what are we doing and those kind of things so i think it would it would be a detriment to the show to not bring her back so i would assume that she's coming back in some form and she'll she'll actually be a witch for uh, for real this time before we get into review scores for this episode and kind of final thoughts for the the series in general i do i kind of want to mention this because like you can't avoid it nowadays um you know i guess we could not talk about it but it's it's, it's you know i i want to hear your thoughts on it specifically too because uh you know we now have kind of a female voice to one of these episodes um instead of just two old men sitting here talking about these types of things so i want to hear <laughs> your your uh thoughts on it but um we're only three episodes in, but the media and the, in some ways the kind of cast and crew behind the creative team here behind the show, they've kind of dubbed Agatha all along the gayest Marvel show ever. And I know we're only three episodes in, but what do you think about those kind of statements being made in general um, about you know this kind of show? And do you feel like Agatha all along is, up until this point, the gayest Marvel show ever? <laughs> so yeah look i think that if anyone is going to make <clears throat> this kind of statement about a show the cast and the creative teams are absolutely the ones to do it uh you know saying something is the gayest ever it's not exclusionary it, it's expressive so it really does comment i feel especially after watching these on how these identities can be expressed seamlessly in the show it's not a focal point it's just a layer of who they are so me personally 
when I watched Agatha all along, I 100% could feel the gay <laughs> in a good way. Mm. As soon as April came in, as soon as she got into that little strappy black outfit and they started f- fighting immediately, I said, oh, yeah, this is awesomely gay. So when I say that, I mean... You know, beyond that, there are these moments of queer identity presented in the show. Like you said, the teen, he's not in the closet. How do we know that? He answers his phone or he looks at his phone at a certain point. It's his boyfriend. He -hmm. mentions, oh, he worries about me in the seamless way that it's just part of who he is as a character. There are these moments of queer identity presented, but we're just seeing who the characters are. So... One of our cast members said on a red carpet that witches have often been seen as inherently queer. You know, Mm. they're a little different. So I can see why the cast and crew do feel pride in claiming that title for this show. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I think that's that's completely fair. I think the the cynical part of me with some of this Disney stuff, because we, we, we do a lot of this with now with the Acolyte, now with this show, with, with all kinds. It's not just a Disney thing. It's just, you know, times change and things like that, and I'm not against any of that. I'm just – it sounds like from your thoughts, you, you feel like this is a show that's not – do you feel like the inclusionary nature of it and like the the actual show is not just Agatha all along is not just checking a box for gayness? Does that make sense? Do you feel like yeah. it's it's really the characters are being written that way or is it is it a show another show that's just like we got we want to check a box to promote this to this demographic? Yeah, it it does not feel like a box check like let's just shove a gay character into this. That's not what it feels like. You know, we talk about this quote unquote sexual tension um, between Rio and Agnes or Agatha. And what is that tension though, right? We see the same tension between her and various members of the coven. It's not that it's being shoved in here. It's just a, it's just a feeling that you get when you watch it. Hmm. I wonder what's Mm. going on between them in the same way that I would think that between any two actors acting in that same way, in the show so i i for me it doesn't feel shoehorned in it just feels like layers of certain characters everybody's not gay it's not a massive talking point it really is just something that's kind of mentioned in the exploration of who people are so for me it doesn't feel shoehorned in yeah i i I would agree with that i just you know it's i wanted to kind of bring it up because it's it's been made a lot of and there's people that will You'll know that they'll. You know, there's people that will uh, you know, view farm the the outrage against those types of statements, and there's for there's people that will do them for actual real um, reasons of hate. You know, mm-hmm. on, on this platform, those people that will do them for, like I said, for rage farming for the views that really probably don't feel like that, but will will in, incite the people that do. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to bring it up because, like, you know, I think it's 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 a conversation piece when you see these kind of articles and stuff. And I just feel like, too, you know, I just always want to make sure, for me, the big thing is, like, when we do these shows, like, we're not just doing things in a story to to do them. We're not just checking boxes. You know, if this, you know, if, if I was an actor in one of these shows and it was asked, asked of me, like, I would just, you know, I would want to be able to say, like, maybe it is the gayest show. Maybe, maybe it's the straightest show. Maybe we made the most asexual show ever created. But, uh, you know, I want to talk about how watching the show made you feel, right? Were you, were you invested in the story? Did you like the characters? Did you empathize with those characters? Did you feel that they were there were real stakes and consequences for the, like the characters' actions because that's the show we're trying to make. You know, granted, we're we're trying to make a show about an all-powerful witch from the pages of, of Marvel Comics. I get that, but we're trying to to tell a story with uh, with her that you, as an audience, kind of find interesting and worth your time and money for your subscription to Disney Plus. And it's about it's about telling that story. And in a story, there are straight characters, there are gay characters, there are all types of people and ethnicities and cultures and sexual preferences and our show just like in the real world is that um you know if it would be my hope that when we include gay characters or have a character that represents any group of people not traditionally represented in shows like these is that we you know we kind of handle it respectfully and we have a reason to kind of highlight certain aspects of a character's sexuality 
for a reason. We're not trying to just check a box. We're not doing it because we're trying to find a way to sleazily market this show to other demographics by playing, you know, paying lip service to a character we haven't treated like a, a real character, but because we're telling a a story and this character's sexuality is part of the story. If the character's sexuality doesn't add to the story, you know, let's not highlight it for no reason. That's always kind of my stance, like, on these shows. I think, I hope that's a fair assessment or a fair take on it. Like, I don't mm-hmm. I don't think it's a, a too cynical way to look at it. I just always advocate for the story point of it. But for me, so far, three episodes in, I agree with you that I don't think it's, I don't think it's being done right now at this point. And it could change, but I don't think even cynically that it's just, like, checking a box so much right now. But I do think sometimes we make a little bit more of a deal about it than maybe even it's intended to be. You know what I mean? Like we, Mm -hmm. as an audience and maybe even the media, we put too much emphasis on like, is this the gayest thing ever? Is it the straightest thing ever? Like, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's why I kind of wanted to kind of bring it up. Because like even for me, like I don't need – I don't need a Batman movie all the time where Batman has a love interest. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I don't, like, you know, I don't need Batman bringing some Gotham skank and banger on the back computer <laughs> to prove he's straight. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't need that. Unless Cat, Catwoman, if she's in the movie to, to further their relationship or to be a part of the movie and a part of the plot or, or any kind of love interest for Batman, if they're there for story reasons, I'm all for it. If not, get them out too. Like it's not just about gay characters; mm-hmm. it's about it's about what serves the story. So that's my point overall. Uh, anything else you'd like to add before we go on to final thoughts here? No, I mean I I agree with things like that. Just whoops, for me it's even like I I'm not a fan of having random romance lines shoehorned into a story you where they not. have You've, nothing. I've learned this about you. Yeah. <laughs> they have nothing to do with anything, and I mean for me the moment in that episode where Teen checks his phone, I thought it was it is introducing the fact that number one his person doesn't know where he is, he mm-hmm. doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have somebody who is waiting for him, you know, and knows where you are. He's kind of just blinking out. And to me, it that was part of the plot, right? That your person who you're mm-hmm. supposed to know where you are has no idea where you are right now. You're covering something up too. And right. why is that? Regardless of whether it was a guy or a gal or a non-binary pal on the phone, it that's what it was to me. So for me personally... I while I looked at it and thought, mm, this is gay, I didn't even <laughs> really think about it so much because, again, it was just part of who the characters are. So fair. Agreed and fair. Yes. Um, uh, let's see. Final review time, Christina. Give me your final thoughts and review score for Agatha All Along Episode 3. All right. So I am giving episode three a solid eight. Again, I've been nice with this, but I really did like this one. I thought it was great. Like you said, visually, the road is beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. The hallucinations that they have are so vivid. And I really did think that the hallucinations as part of that trial, they told stories about who the coven is and why each one of them are willing to risk walking that road knowing that they might not survive again we learn more about agatha herself we uncover what might be hidden motives like you said she was trying not to drink the wine we learn more about her so Mm -hmm. for me i really think this episode it was engaging it was entertaining it was visually beautiful it's the best so far it's an eight for me Awesome. I'm still a little bit more harder on it. I'm I, again. I think this is the best episode for sure. Um, I think it does raise the level. I think, and I'm hoping that there's higher heights to the show. I'm gonna. I'm still gonna stay in that realm. I'm gonna go six. I think this is a really decent episode. Again, I don't think the comedy was insufferable or anything. I still think it's a little little hit and miss here or there. But I did enjoy it a little bit more. I did like the first trial. I want more of that stuff to keep me interested. I was way more compelled for episode four. I do want to see what's going on. I do want to see if they do something, bring Mrs. Hart back, see what these trials are, explore some of these angles with these witches. I want to find out what happened to Alice's mom. There is some things I'm genuinely interested in. If you can keep this momentum, fantastic. Like I'm on board. I don't think this is going to end up being 
in the top five of anybody's favorite Marvel TV shows ever, if we even got to five yet. I don't know how many actually we've gotten, but I don't <laughs> think it's going to be anybody's top show. I think this is going to end up being a decent to good show. It's not going to be blowing people away. I don't think, but if it does, I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it when we come back and talk about the rest of the episodes. But for me, I think it's a decent episode. It's very solid. It was way more compelling than the first two. Again, one and two should have been, been combined, and this should have been episode two, and I think we'd have been on even more of a, a better track. But I'm looking forward to episode four to see what happens and see kind of where we go from here. So it's a six for me. All right, before we get out of here, Christina, let's get to know you a little bit better, give you a little oh. bit of time to shine. Let's check your nerd credentials here. I've got a few nerd-related questions for you. Uh, you ready to answer them? <laughs> okay, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so uh, we got some kind of either ors and a couple little things here. I'll ask you to rank a few things too. Uh, either ors. Let's start with those. Uh, Batman or Spider Man? Oh, Batman's my number one. Batman. Okay, Justice League or X Men? Ooh, X Men actually. Ooh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry Potter or the Lord of the Rings? Don't fight me. Harry Potter. <laughs> Ooh, well, Don't this fight was, me. This was Christina's first and last episode, <laughs> folks. Uh, what is uh, what is the best animated show of the 90s? Damn, that's a hard one. I'm going to say one of my go-tos was Doug, man. I really love Doug. That was a daily, but also I came home every day and watched X-Men Animated Series. Ooh, but also Batman. I'm going to say X-Men Animated Series. Final answer. Okay. All right. Thank you for not saying Doug. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've ever Come watched on, an episode man. of Doug. Come Doug on, was man. like Hey Arnold for me. I'm not Quail throwing shade. I don't know. I don't know anything about him. But like, there's shows sometimes where I can't even get into him because of the art style. And like, Doug was like that. And Hey Arnold. And what was that show? Arthur with like the rabbit. Yeah. Okay. He's an and aardvark. Okay. Is he an aardvark? Okay. Didn't he have a rabbit friend? Yeah, Buster. Like a white rabbit friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we some of those shows I couldn't. Friend. Like, I had a tough time getting into, like, Ed, Ed, and Eddie because of the art style when I was a kid, but I did get into that show. That. I, I love that show after a while. But, yeah, I just, yeah, not Doug. It can't Come be on, Doug. man. You can't Quail say man. Doug was the best <laughs> animated show of the 90s. If you agree, though, put it in the comments. Was Doug the best episode, the no! animated show of the 90s? <laughs> Nobody said that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, she did say X-Men, but yeah. Does anybody out there actually think it was Doug, and I'm wrong? Um, okay. The Office or Parks and Rec? Office. Office for me. Yeah, that's a tough one. God, I love that's both a of them. That's yeah. a tough it one, but tough. Office is, I'm pretty sure I know almost every word of every episode, so yeah. I'm going to stick with Office. <laughs> uh, let's change it up a little bit. Fuck, Mary kill. Fuck, Mary kill. God. The Joker, Bane, and Mr. Freeze. Okay, we're I'm I'm fucking Bane because I likes a big boy. So we're fucking Bane. We're gonna marry Mr. Freeze. What's too big though? No, there's no such thing, baby. Oh, wow. okay. So I like Feel me bad a about big yourself, boy. gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna say we're marrying Mr. Freeze because he has proven that he is very dedicated, even if you are a frozen block. So we're definitely That's marrying true. Mr. Freeze. He's there to the end of time and we're gonna have to kill joker i mean i might hate fuck him but he's just he's bananas we're just gonna murder him i feel like if i let his penis in me one time that'll be it for me <laughs> that'll gotcha. be it in a bad way yeah okay i like your rationale for mr freeze he is a very devoted husband so i yes. think you chose you chose correctly there <laughs> um uh let's go to ranking uh, rank these films uh one through five with one being the best jurassic oh. park the Godfather, The Matrix, Back to the Future, and The Empire Strikes Back. Oh, man. Okay. One being the best. Mm -hmm. Empire. Empire okay. all of time in this list. Uh, okay. Number two, 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 two. Oh, man. Jurassic Park. Jurassic okay. Park, for sure. Number three. This was my hard one for number two, but Back to the Future. And then Matrix and Godfather and Don't Fight Me on that order. Gotcha. Uh, I, listen, this is one of those things where it's like, you know, you could mix these up any number of ways. So I was never going to give you hell about this one. Like, yeah. uh, it, it, <laughs> it's it's really dealer's choice, personal taste, because I think all these films are probably easily, you, you'll ask 10 people and they'll all have a different number one. So, oh, yeah. And finally, Christina, for those mm -hmm. of you who don't know Christina as well as I do yet, yeah, she has a sense of humor of a 20 year old frat boy. <laughs> 
So, what is the best bro comedy movie of all time? Fuck, you know me. Um, I do love a bromance. Uh, this one, I, I... Fuck. That's a tough decision. But... I really do think it's 40-year-old virgin. It might be the best of all time. It is tr- it's a true American classic. <laughs> you can't you can't beat Boner Jams 03. You can't beat a mention of a Dirty Sanchez. Right. You just can't. It's that it, 40-year-old virgin might be top American cinema for me in the bromance category. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Fantastic. Well, thank you for answering all those on the hot seat, Christina. I hope you guys <laughs> watching this video got to know Christina a little bit. Uh, Christina is definitely, I hope after this, I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. I would definitely love to have Christina back, get her on for some more episodes, uh, do some more videos, watch some more things. But for now, that's it for this episode. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. Feel free to send us an email or get in touch with us on social media. Tal Capes will return. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time. Bye, guys. Bye, Christina.